Tonight we are looking at CSAs, Community Supported Agriculture. Well, we're trying to broaden this uh, concept and we're really looking at how do we best support our growers uh, in producing food for our communities and how might communities ensure food security locally? So these are the, the, the questions we're asking tonight. Uh, we have a number of speakers and um, we're going to start with Judith Hitchman from Urgency. And then we have Fergal Anderson, Joanna Butler and Fergal Smith. Uh, we're going to leave some space for reflections and getting into some conversations amongst ourselves. And then um, I'm going to do just a little bit on the Open Food Network. And Natalie is going to do a little bit more on urgency and um, training and, and education. Um, so you're all very welcome. I mean, we're really just starting to explore how we can bring solidarity um, to our communities and strengthen our local economies. And so the context that we're in uh, is quite important. We're in a pandemic, in a climate and ecological emergency. There's a huge need as we open up this decade, which will probably be the defining decade of our species, uh, to do some quite major shifts and rethinking. We need to shorten supply chains. We need to um, rebuild our communities. We need to restore ecosystems. There is so much work that needs to be done. And there's so uh, much that we can do through the lens of food. And um, so that's what our objective is today, is to explore uh, that today. And um, so my name is Davy Phillip. I'm currently um, the coordinator of the CSA network. But I also coordinate the Open Food Hub in Claude Jordan Community Farm. Claude Jordan Community Farm has now got about 84 subscribers. Uh, we farm here part of the eco village and um, we've been doing that for over 10 years now and we love that model. We realize though that there's many different models of community supported agriculture and that's one of the things that we sort of want to explore tonight. Uh, also that sort of sense of being able to be resilient in our region that we're not dependent on long supply chains uh, with our food coming from halfway across the planet with no relationship with the people that produced it, no sense if it was done in slavery conditions or the ecological impacts of growing that food. And so we're really looking at going local. How do we um, strengthen that local economy? Um, how do we build that local resilience? Okay, so if that's okay, I'm gonna invite everyone to introduce yourselves in the chat. This is an important networking event for CSA Ireland. You know, we want to get a sense of who people are and where they're coming from. So in the next five minutes, as we listen to Judith, uh, please do that. And, and just um, keep, your, keep yourself on mute if you're, if you're um, not speaking. Okay, so we're gonna get started if that's okay. So please introduce yourself in the chat. And we're going to get started tonight with uh, a short presentation from Judith Hitchman. Judith Hitchman is Irish, but she lives in France. And she is the co-president of Urgency, the International Community Supported Agriculture Network. And she's also a board member of Repress, which is a social solidarity network. And um, so very relevant uh, that Judith opens and addresses us here. So Judith, if you're OK, I'll hand over to you. So I'm from Dunmore East, County Waterford, but I've been based outside Ireland for a long, long time. However, I do stay very, very much in touch and I spend several months a year normally in Ireland, the present not being normal. So as David, David said, I am co-president of Urgency and one of the joint coordinators, of the Global Social and Solidarity Economy Network. Now, CSA or Local Solidarity Partnerships between producers and consumers is built on two pillars. The first is food sovereignty, which means realizing in this case, sustainable, healthy, local food systems that provide a decent living for the producers 
and affordable food for the eaters. And the second pillar is solidarity economy, because the current neoliberal economic system really is creating the problems that we need to solve. Now, as Davy said, the fact that we're in a pandemic really is shifting things a lot and shuffling and reshuffling the cards. And it's both a threat and an opportunity to us in terms of revisiting and rebuilding the kind of world we want or being ultimately and totally subjugated to a system that I think most of us are in our own way trying to fight against. Now, what has happened over the last year and a half, if I take it from the highest level at the United Nations General Assembly level, the UN Secretary General signed an agreement with the World Economic Forum. Now, the key movers and shakers of the World Economic Forum include Bill Gates, include many of the companies that produce pesticides, GMs, and so on, and really represent the ultimate in the neoliberal economy. Now, from the UN General Assembly, all the UN agencies have signed similar agreements with the World Economic Forum. Now, this in turn has led to a totally top-down creation of the World Food Systems Summit, which has nothing but nothing to do with our grassroots food systems or feeding ourselves or sustaining our seed saving to preserve our local biodiversity or protecting our artisanal fishers or our small scale food producers, restaurants and food systems in general. On the other hand, we have the social movement starting with the Via Campesina the indigenous people's organizations, the pastoralists, the fishers, and urgency who represent the consumers and producers together. And essentially, we say this is not our food summit. Look at what has happened during the COVID crisis. During the COVID crisis, the first thing that happened was that the supply chain, the long supply chain in the hypermarkets broke down. In the UK, people were fighting, not just over toilet rolls, but also over any fresh food that could come in. And neither Ireland nor the UK nor many countries are food self-sufficient. And if you are not food self-sufficient, it takes very, very little to destabilize your food system and what you're able to buy or what you can put on the table for your family, which is where community supported agriculture comes in and has really shown globally, whether it's in Beijing or in Bristol or in Berlin, just how resilient our local food systems are. Because the whole idea is that it is a relationship between the producers and the eaters there is a contract to grow for the people in your community and feed your community. Now, it takes many forms. The payment uh, system can be based on your income. It can be you pay a given sub and you take what you want. It can be you have a bag of food ready for you every week. But during the COVID crisis, what has happened is that it has broadened out hugely into bringing those food producers at local level who couldn't get their food to market into feeding the local communities. Now, I mean, one of the nicest examples of that is in the Spanish and the French Basque countries where they have really built territorial food systems and I think that this is the way we're going to be going. In other places, 
there have been home deliveries when people are not able to get out because they are vulnerable or whatever, the CSA or LSBA growers have arranged home deliveries. So again, it's been a totally different attitude to the click and collect that you get in Tesco's or wherever, but it is bringing communities together. It is supporting the producers so that they can live and get their food to the people in their communities. Now, what we need is not only to do this ourselves, which we all are in our different countries around the world, because urgency represents about 3 million membership subscriptions on all five continents. I mean, we are a truly global network, but it does mean trying to bring some pressure to bear on our politicians both at local level and at national level to support what we're doing, to support us through making land available to young farmers who want to grow for their communities, supporting by having legislation that allows seed saving as opposed to outlawing seed saving so that no producer is dependent on GM or CRISPR technology by ensuring that those people who are vulnerable either financially or physically within the community have a form of access to healthy local food at a price that they can afford by subsidizing them in a way that is appropriate for that community. So I think I'm, how am I doing time-wise? I make it nearly eight minutes there, Davey. Okay, well, you can wrap up or is that you finishing? Um, I can go on forever, but I don't want to throw too much into the pot at this stage. I'm going to be here for, I hope, most of the evening. Okay, well. And, you know, I think that those are the key things that really it is organizing at community level, networking between communities at national level and networking at international level through urgency and the social solidarity economy. Just one word about urgency. <clears throat> Our role at international level is advocacy, which takes us into the UN. It takes us into the farm to fork strategy and other EU elements. And the second very important role is the training that we do through projects. And that's what Natalie is going to talk about because Urgency, unlike most international networks, has now a full training team and is building a training hub. Okay, thank you, Judith. Yeah. Um, some appreciation and silent applause for Judith there. Uh, opening our little CSA gathering tonight. Thank you so much, Judith. I think that's really important. You mentioned one thing you said as an LSPA or uh, the Local Solidarity Based Partnerships for Agroecology, which is a quite new term for a lot of us, uh, but really based on direct relationships between the producers and consumers and allowing the consumer to access uh, goods and produce made are produced in an agroecological sensitive, sensitive way. And CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, is one form of that local solid, solidarity-based partnerships for agroecology. So, so just let's pause and reflect on how many people are here. One, I'm delighted, there's 42 people, and I know our classroom is full of people as well and our volunteers. And um, so that's, uh, it's great to see such diversity. I can see we've got people from Tullet Bio, other CSAs, other um, farms, and uh, lots of people with uh, different skills. So just to appreciate that diversity that we have here tonight. Now, before I go into the three speakers that we have, I'd like maybe just to pause for any reflections or questions at this stage, just to maybe even hear some other voices. So you can either put your hand up in the reactions on the bottom toolbar um, or just indicate in your hand, but I can't see every now, everyone now because we're uh, at quite a big numbers. 
Anyone like to ask a question or make a reflection? I can see our classroom downstairs. It looks a little dark there, but um, maybe turn the light on so we can see it's that good. Yeah, there's a great range of growers, uh, Eileen's reflecting in the chat. And it's just great to see so many old friends from Feeding Ourselves here um, in tonight and uh, part of the people from the CSA networks or other permaculture networks and all sorts, Tall of Bio. How many people are downstairs there, Debbie? Five or six, maybe. I don't know. Rebecca, how many people are there with you down there? It's too Seven. dark to even see your hand. Seven, eight. Okay, so we're almost at 50 tonight. So well done, everyone. Okay. I'm going to now invite you not to sit back and listen to these three short presentations, but to sit forward and to think about any reflections or insights and put them into the chat. That means we can harvest this into something that might be useful for the development of other CSAs or the development of other local solidarity partnerships uh, or food initiatives. So please share any insights and reflections that are coming up. Many of you have a long background in this field and there's a lot of um, complementary ideas that would be quite good to, to bring in. So please do um, bring in any questions, reflections, insights in the chat, and I'll create some space after our next three presentations. Is everyone okay? I think no Natalie one? wanted to, to interject something there, Davy. Thank you, Eileen. Natalie? Ah, uh, thank you. But maybe I'll write it in the chat. I, I'm just interested, maybe if people want to share in the chat a bit from growers, like what solutions did you use during that lockdown time? You know, like how how did you cope with it? Um, you know, how did you get your produce to 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 the people? So it would be really interesting if you could share that maybe in the chat. Right. Uh, I'll I'll just uh, before I introduce the speakers again, our two framing questions for tonight, which reflects a little what Natalie has said. Uh, but maybe with less COVID, but that's good. The two questions are, how do we best uh, support our growers in producing food uh, for our communities, uh, for, for our citizens? And then how might communities ensure food security? And in some ways, uh, I'll bring this in a bit more, this framing, but practicing food sovereignty now is uh, the opportunity that we have, not just to, as we might hear, demand it, demand the right of food sovereignty. But actually now with regenerative farming practices and restorative practices, we can, we can um, grow food more agroecologically um, with new processes of uh, getting to our communities with CSAs and the Open Food Network, which I'll mention, and the things that Judith were saying, we can now take control and autonomy over distribution. That means we can completely practice food sovereignty, and in this decade, we're going to need to. So anyone has any insights on those two questions? How do we support our local uh, growers and producing food for our communities? And how can our communities ensure food security uh, locally? And we've got three speakers with the uh, objective to maybe just from their perspective, share some thoughts and insights with you. Uh, we're gonna have Fergal Anderson, Joanna Butler, and Fergal Smith. And we're gonna start with Fergal Anderson. So just a little bit on Fergal Anderson. Fergal Anderson uh, used to work for Via Capucina, which as uh, Judith mentioned there, they've been lobbying and advocating for food sovereignty, actually coined the term in the 90s. Uh, he's also a farmer, and one of the founders or co-founders of Tullough Bio, our Land Workers Alliance. He is uh, a regular at the Feeding Ourselves conference we do here in, in Clock Jordan. And he, with his, uh, with his partner Manu and his daughter, live and work on uh, a farm, a uh, root and leaf. So over to you, Fergal Anderson. Thanks, David. That's uh, leaf and root, we like to say, but that's leaf and root. semantics, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think the last feeding ourselves was the last time I had a pint in a pub as well, which has been a long time, but... Uh, uh, fond memories of that, of that. Hopefully, be more of those. Yeah. Um, 
as, as David said, I'm involved with Toll of Bio, which is a, a new organization in Ireland. Um, and one of the things that we've talked about a lot is this, is this issue of local food production, um, particularly from the perspective of, of growers and producers. And how can we kind of, I suppose, support producers, but also support the livelihoods of producers in particular. And we have a, a kind of, we've developed, I suppose, a, what we call like a local food policy framework kind of. Um, and I, I might just go through that because I think some of the points that we're looking at there would be relevant to this discussion and they might sort of be fruitful and useful for, for, for further thought. One of the things that we're, we, we'd like to, we're, we're proposing uh, as a policy measure is a, is a direct payment for people who are supplying local markets. I mean, there's a lot of money goes into agricultural subsidies every year and um, people who are supplying local markets receive little or none of it as far as we can ascertain. Uh, so that's one of the things we're proposing. That's a, that'd be a direct payment directly to producers who are supplying local markets. The second thing is um, to do with finance and supports, financial supports. That means zero interest loans or um, you know, guaranteed loans for producers who are starting off, producers who want to install new infrastructure on their farms. Um, the third thing would be a labor activation scheme of sorts. That would mean that we begin to look at reskilling people within who have lost jobs or who need to want to get involved in local food production uh, through social welfare schemes linked to I don't know if you can imagine a kind of a farm bridge type scheme which would uh, the state would support workers on farms to help increase production help resolve the labor issue on farms which is often one which can limit production and limit the expansion uh, of local food production um, and a link to that I suppose we're proposing a new kind of land use strategy which would be something which begins to look at how we can provide access to land for young farmers, uh, for new production in, in urban areas in particular. Um, and also how we can restructure exist around agricultural land in Ireland, which make it kind of, uh, which inhibit, I suppose, uh, the establishment of new small scale producers. Um, is my connection okay? You can hear me okay, yeah? Just, yep. Okay. Uh, the next thing, I suppose, would be something along the lines of a community food hub, which we'd like to see local authorities beginning to facilitate uh, the kind of interactions between uh, producers and consumers to take some of the burden away from producers in terms of getting their, their food to market. We think that's something that local authorities could get involved with if they were more competent than they are. Uh, that's just a kick in local authorities there. Um, and the last thing, I suppose, peer learning for producers. And that's kind of because in reality, the skills that we may need to produce the kind of quantities of food that we're talking about don't always exist. Uh, and and, and that, that goes from being the skills in terms of um, machinery or machinery itself might not exist. Um, there's lots of things like that. How far, a lot of good examples of that kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning already existing out there, but I suppose uh, it's just something that has to be thought about within that context. So the other thing I'd say maybe about, and just as my own perspective on, on uh, uh, producing for local markets, and we've, we've tried lots of different uh, models uh, from local, going to the local market in the local town, to a CSA, to a kind of a box scheme, to some sort of back to a CSA. And, and we ended up, when I was supplying a restaurant, we kind of have a very close relationship with the restaurant who buys all our stuff basically and processes it never like a, a particular kind of, uh, solidarity partnership there um, but one thing that I think we should need to recognize is that consumption changing that people need to recognize this about the consumers need to know is that they're changing their consumption habits won't necessarily affect structural change in this it won't necessarily make a cultural but this is the kind of step that we found was was, was slightly lacking in, in our experience of the CSA was that there had to be participation. And we think we need to create a kind of environment where people feel that participating in local food production is the same as participating in their local GAA club. It's the same as participating in their local community. Actually, if I could just uh, cut across you for a second. Time. Sorry, if I could yep. cut across you for a second. I've messaged you, but um, you are getting very glitchy. If there's any way maybe you could turn off your video and just do sound yep, only. No problem, yep, I'll do that. I probably won't speak for much longer anyway, but um, yeah, so, um, and I mean, there's, there's lots of different options, I suppose, for what, what can be done. There's the CSA, which I think uh, which Judith explained clearly there, but there's probably also other 
um, things which have existed in Ireland that we can look at and say these could be pathways to kind of creating that CSA model. I mean, one thing that I've heard neighbours even here talk about was uh, this kind of a tillage field that farmers would share, that they'd always have one tillage field that would kind of rotate uh, and they'd grow kind of a main crop in that field and share out the kind of proceeds of that. Now, I mean, that's something that would require some sort of structure around it um, in terms of like people would buy a share of, of a kind of a main crop of something that they could store. Um, I suppose it's like a little bit like a CSA, but it would be kind of a single crop or a multiple crop thing. Um, that's just one example. And I suppose, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the bottom line for, for me would be that we create the income for the producer. So, I mean, th that's the other thing that I think gets kind of left behind. I mean, farmers need to get paid somehow. And that, that's that's gotta be a priority for any kind of group that comes together is looking at ensuring a fair livelihood for, for the farmer. And I think um, a lot of the time, all the kind of work of production, distribution, marketing, it falls on the shoulders of, of, of one, one person or a family and it can, be, it can be nearly too much to take on. And not everybody has those skills at their disposal. So I think, yeah, th that's where the participation comes in. That's where the engagement comes in. And maybe that's, I don't know how you create that, that uh, but I mean, that's um, something we can talk about further maybe as, as we go on. Yeah, very good question, Fargo. Fargo, thank you. Um, some appreciation either with your reaction button or the silent uh, clap there. Fergal, you broke up a little, but I think it all came through pretty clearly. So a couple of questions already in the chat, just the uh, Ollie asking when that policy document might be available. Any, can you? Yeah, we're gonna try and finalize it in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully in two weeks time. And then uh, Judith was asking, um, it'd be good to be here how the Food Policy Council and work with local authorities progresses so that they can bring it forward for other policy uh, and build on the success. So aggregating all the different actions that happen and urgency would be perfect for that. Okay, if there's any other thoughts, insights, questions, put them into the chat and we'll look at it when we open up for reflection. Um, thanks again, Fergal. And I'm gonna introduce our next speaker who is Joanna Butler. Uh, Joanna is based up in Donegal with an amazing homestead with her husband Milo and um, her family. Um, she is a horticulture teacher, permaculture teacher. She teaches permaculture with, with us at Cultivate sometimes. She's a founder of the Community Gardens Network and more recently the Donegal Food Growers. And she's going to share some slides with us uh, as well. So Joanna, yeah, are you ready? Great. Thank you, David. Okay, so as David mentions there, we're based up in Northwest Donegal and uh, we, like in the scale of things, I suppose we're pretty small scale, um, but we do sell our local, our surplus to the local community and fingers crossed uh, when things return to some sort of normality that we start supplying a local restaurant. So we're passionate about food growing and educating and empowering people to grow food for themselves using these natural and sustainable practices. And I've been growing food since 2005 and then involved in my community gardens uh, and community garden projects since 2013. So uh, it's been quite a journey since, since we started. Um, I'm currently involved in seed saving projects with ISSA um, and also social farms and gardens in the north. So I'm going to share with you because since 2017, we've been running workshops here at Organic Gardens, but since obviously since COVID happened, uh, you know, we had to stop and spend the first months of COVID giving money back to people, which was pretty unfortunate. Um, but we adapted fast enough. And what we did is we went online running workshops on the basics of growing food. And to date, we have had over 250 participants. And the thing about it is, is that they all said the same thing, that the, not only did they want to grow food, but they wanted access to local food. Uh, they also wanted to take part in caring for their environment uh, by less food mines, less plastic and no chemicals. So before I had, uh, we had um, been in, or involved in Donegal Community Garden Network, um, and I thought, I kept feeling that this was going to start coming up again, but I wanted it to be more than just the community gardens. Uh, so we put the word out again through the Community Garden Network um, that we wanted to start a food growing network to involve not only food uh, community growers, but also food, uh, food, individual food growers as well. So I'm going to give you a wee bit of a presentation and uh, 
I see there's a few uh, members of our planning group here tonight as well. So this is the first time that they've seen it as well because I was under the pressure uh, from, from getting this ready. So I just hope that this all goes well. Uh, and I just, from the beginning there. So we put the word out um, that we would start, uh, and that we wanted to start a food growers network uh, there just before Christmas. We started off with a cup of tea and a catch up just for growers in Donegal. And the idea was that the network for community gardens, small scale farmers and individual food growers in our county to come together. We wanted to connect and empower small food growers in Donegal to build on the community capacity and support all members of the network uh, to help create sustainable circular economy that enables growers to enhance their setup and grow food for themselves and the surplus then for their community. And then to show people in our community uh, the skills to the to grow in the, the the food to grow in the food and also to cook in the food as well. So as I say there, we started with the monthly meetings, the cuppa and the catch up, and then we gave collaboration opportunities. What I wanted to hear was how the community gardens were getting on and then how people were getting on. And we started to see the individual growers as well uh, joining in. So we had guest speakers as well to encourage that. Now, the question that we're asked tonight, uh, how do we best support growers in producing food for our communities? And it's very interesting because this is exactly the question that we are asking uh, when we do meet up as a group. And what we have done is we've actually created now a planning group. So as I say, some representatives are there tonight uh, in this uh, meeting. So it's great to see. Uh, we currently have representation on our group covering all of the important sectors within food growing. So I think that community gardens, obviously uh, for me, because I've been involved in it, these are places to connect families and to help provide public space for community food growing practices. We also uh, have included horticulture therapy in there because this is a way to connect the physical and the mental health in this time, much needed time. Uh, also, we've got policy and assurance that, we, that the food we grow is sustainably managed. And then we want to create campaigns within the network that will add value to the and promote the network as well. So there's a lot of ideas at the minute that we've got. Uh, we would also like to develop good governance and strategy to support our work. And we also want to get an audit, audit of what's growing in Donegal. So we want to do a stock take as such as into who's growing what uh, and, and what do we need to produce in the county. We also want to look at varieties that suit local areas, uh, maybe to uh, suit location or soil uh, or whatever. We want to also look at best places maybe to grow, for instance, apples. We noticed that there was a huge uh, lack of apples uh, that you can get in the shop. And also when we look at the amount of imports, can we look at, at, at alternative crops to grow that are perhaps more resilient now with the weather? Uh, so we want to draw the attention um, to localise more perishables as well, while being transparent and trusting uh, relationships um, with international food producers for our food, because, you know, for other foods that we can't grow. Some of our members have come back and they've said that, for instance, that they want to see things like a tool library in the county. And this was uh, where we could share, um, we could share our tools, for instance. Uh, I heard knowledge sharing as well, that would be quite important. Uh, but we're, we're just currently working on our vision for the network to be able to have a clear roadmap of where we're going. Uh, this is one of these new tools that we can use, uh, the, the, the food map or what the word map or whatever. Um, the second question then we were asked tonight was how might communities ensure food locally? And again, we're looking at that as well. We're a big fan of the ripple effect. Uh, we want to empower small growers to access sustainable materials and infrastructure. We want to enable communication and knowledge exchange, enable regenerative growing, uh, enable adaption for climate change as well, and then for our neighbours to follow suit. So this is not a competition. We want everybody doing it in every small village uh, of the county and obviously nationally as well. Food security is strongest when uh, food is produced and distributed locally. So building a local community that builds local economy. And we also want to be helping our communities making decisions to design their own local sustainable food networks that prioritise Tr uh, prioritise trust and nutrition. So I heard mention there the hubs as well. So in Donegal, we would love to have, this is our blue sky thinking, uh, for to have four hubs in the county, uh, 
Donegal is a big county, so uh, north, south, east and west. Each hub would have the capacity to allow members to visit their growing areas and to see what's happening. Um, they would also have the capacity for a community cafe or a shop uh, or a focal point to gather in the community. So we're currently linking in with the Open Food Network to explore ways to do this digitally also. And the hub would have a clean kitchen, ideally, uh, on site that would, would also enable growers and producers to make jams, chutneys or uh, fermented food for sale in the cafe or the shop. And then each uh, food growing hub would have on site activities like community gardens, uh, seed saving, other environmental activities that can be in turn funded by the sales of the shop or the cafe. And this would create a, a self-sustaining entity over time. Uh, and then the dream would be that each hub that we have would work with 10 individual growers and 10 community gardens in their surrounding areas so that they would also contribute any surplus food that they would have uh, at market cost or for a barter relationship. And I think that that's really kind of it. Um, but we're only starting our journey. Uh, we're at the beginning and we're delighted to so, so far to have been supported by uh, our local development company, uh, our local development company in a shown development partnership. And then the Donegal Volunteer Centre have reached out and um, offered to help us to be able to get a volunteer committee. Because one of the things that we've noticed um, when we're creating these committees is that the people involved in the growing um, are generally busy doing their thing and they're growing. So hopefully our committee that's in the admin and all the paperwork that we don't like uh, can be another can be a volunteer board that wants to help out us as well. So we currently have 28 members on the network uh, and hopefully this will grow as we start to realize this roadmap in the future. Brilliant, so Joanne. I think that's it. I hope I did a time justice. <laughs> you did. And uh, there's some great um, pieces in the chat there. Uh, Donald McCormack saying that we should nominate Donegal as the new location for the decentralized Department of Agriculture. So you're you're making some waves and ripples here in our CSA gathering. Yeah. No, that was fantastic. Um, we're going to get into a bit of a conversation in in a, in, in about another five six minutes. Um, but we're going to hear from one more speaker who probably needs no introduction here. Uh, Fergal Smith. Fergal. Uh, runs his uh, runs the Moy Hill farm with his wife Sally and uh, he's an advocate of holistic management and regenerative agriculture and is someone that is so passionate about these topics it's infectious so I'm going to pass to you Fergal Smith thanks Davey and um, yeah thanks Joanne and oh hold on now my series on speak to me and yeah and Fergal um yeah I yeah it's a big you know there are big questions and big topics that we can all obviously talk uh, a long time about um fergal is like me and fergal work on talib bio together and i suppose to talk about the solutions yeah that's what talib bio is about and that local food strategy policy that we're working on is kind of you know we're at this weeks and weeks now skype call once a week up late with you know eight it, you know, up to their knees in as farmers so we're really picking through the the details of Irish agriculture and all of it the legal system the grants you know land use how do we get training you know there's so many elements that I could talk about but this has taken you know weeks and weeks and we're still we're going to have to spend quite a few more zoom calls as a team with people who have experienced all different elements of agriculture so it's a big one and we're you know we're going to be working on that and it won't be maybe there'll be better ideas than what we come up with but it's it'll, it'll take a lot of robust teasing out i think to get into these solutions and i think a lot of it comes down to we're working in an old paradigm of the industrial model the legal system you know the great new solutions are perfect but most people shop through an industrial model so we can't just chuck that away we have to work with it and how we get through that is it's a bit kind of clunky and messy probably for the next few years but there's no doubt it's going that way there's no doubt everyone wants to go that way um i suppose my thing i was just going to bring in was just a little bit of a perspective of what it's like um from doing the csa and we've tried them all like and so is fergal as well but um we also so we didn't csa in originally i love the philosophy i love the 
yeah, the whole ethos. I was completely sold on it. And that's how we started. And it's a really nice way to build up um, great, you know, a great kind of relationship in your community of your consumers that are around you. And yeah, they're still buying us off us today. So it, it is a lovely thing, but you're only, I think for quite some time, you're only ever going to appeal to a certain person in the community with the CSA, just because you got to be a little bit, you know, outside the box thinking to commit to your food for the year. So we used to sell our surplus at the markets, which are great, but markets are only great if it's a good market. Um, so you need good markets. And that's the bit in the policy where we want the councils to really push markets in each town. Um, and then there's restaurants, which is great for the surplus in the middle of summer, you know, if you can get a good restaurant. But again, it's they're they're fragile they all close down you know so they're not uh, you know that reliable in other ways um and then we explore the rico which is this um finnish um, man thomas who created that and it's really simple you know i'm sure people know about it but just using facebook and people don't even call it rico like loads of people are doing similar rico things through facebook and it's very simple because there's no making of a website everyone knows how it works facebook is very simple to use and uh, we've done that. It's it's good technically, but again, it goes back to the farmer having to do admin. The farmer has to sit down at a computer. Um, you know, it's all a bit kind of, it's only going to appeal to certain people again because it's not as casual or convenient. So the best one that we now kind of mainly are doing is our farm shop, which works for everyone. It works for someone who likes CSA. It also works for your next door neighbor. It works for a tourist in town like anyone can go by our shop you know it's open for three or four days a week but that obviously only works for certain farms you know certain certain farms that work for most farms it doesn't so i would say the farm shop is the simplest no admin <clears throat> very easy to man and then a good market i don't think you'll ever beat you know markets have been around for hundreds of years um so yeah i'm just talking about my experience in all of it csa is lovely it's really really good and i think the movement will gather as people get more conscious of it trying to answer some of the questions i just wanted to bring in just my perspective because i think fergal has talked kind of what i would say are the solutions to deal with these big questions in talopio and joanne on the ground stuff <clears throat> that i love that that reminds me of uh, my community garden days and having little events because it's that is the grassroots stuff and it's where you meet people and you have a cup of tea but we need loads of that. So I suppose me and Fergal are kind of looking at how do we transition the big stuff like where, you know, the aging population of the country of farmers, how do they transfer that land into new up and coming people? But these people can't, they're not going to, a farmer isn't going to hand over 100 acres to a nice bright eyed, bushy tailed, you know, regenerative farmer has, who has no experience. They're just not going to do it. So we need to have the right training for these young people we need to have a good legal agreements to hand over land like it's a big deal in this country handing land over to someone who doesn't you know have family farming backgrounds or whatever so it's these are really big topics that we have to get right if we want it to change in the next few years in the right direction and yeah that's why me and Fergal are spending many an evening on Tall of Bio calls because we think having an organization that's going to go to governments but also farmers can come to this organization and see that we've done the work and we also understand beef dairy poultry you know horticulture we understand all the the elements we're not just telling them they have to be a regenerative farmer and you know not giving them any way roadmap through it so is there anything else i suppose yeah i think the the transition thing i think is going to be a big one i think that if and it mightn't be Tall of Bio that does that because that's a big thing. It's like legally trying to, you know, there's examples in France where they have the organization that is a, you know, in between the, the, the retiring farmer and a new entrant and how we do all these internships to get them through that phase. I think that's going to be a big part of um, it. I think that Joanne said at the end there, and I would totally say about how communities can support uh, food sovereignty it's community-led um initiatives are going to be way stronger than farmer-led because the farmers are knackered they're working every hour of the day 
and most of them want to be farmers they don't want to be market marketing people delivery people whatever so if communities come together and show they want a csa or they want a rico or they want a local farm shop the farmer will be delighted you know the farmer needs to feel it's going in the right way they're not going to pour loads of energy into csa and then you know it doesn't work but if the community are saying we want it we've 100 members so the farmers like great you know i'll i'll supply into that have a more secure model so i think yeah i also think the community the you know the population now is a little bit further ahead when they were when we started the csa obviously because of you know the last year so i think the consumers are actually probably a little bit more primed for starting community led initiative so it's a good time to be putting out all these um yeah direct selling models into the community and people can come together and you know ask a local farmer and i think farmers would be delighted if they saw the the need for it but it's it's hard for a farmer to get off his treadmill and create a whole new direct selling system when they're busy enough as it is so perfect that's about me uh, Fergal, thank you so much. Uh, Fergal, um, Joanna and Fergal, that was a, a great kickoff to our conversation. So there's a lot there. Uh, there's, there's quite an active chat now uh, going through different questions. And I'd like to open up and hear some other voices. Uh, um, Eileen, you're going to come in, but let me just let, frame something. So as we started at the start, we're moving into a decade of disruption where our behavior and worldviews are going to change quite radically in this decade. And I feel that this is a silver lining for the work that we've all been doing, that we are going to have people more aware of short supply chains and locally produced and supporting our local economy through supporting our local producers. So there's always a silver lining here, but we need to be ready for this. And I agree with what Fergal ended with there, that farmers are tired and probably not got the skill sets to set up these distribution and these networks. Uh, also, our communities who are going to have to do that and support our farmers also need livelihoods and incomes because our incomes and livelihoods, as we're seeing with the pandemic, are being wiped out. So we do need to rethink. And this is a crisis of imagination. We can't imagine what this is. And part of our role, I think, is helping uh, communities and farmers see the opportunities and going in this direction that we are looking at. So let's hear some voices and uh, come in, uh, either put your hand up in the reactions. And Eileen, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, no, no, I was just looking at, uh, I think um, Judith put into the chat as well, you know, as long as communities are aware of what's possible in realistic terms and are educated to eat seasonally, and just as a re response to that, I think education around good eating is key and seasonal eating. And I was just wondering, like, I know that an awful lot of community organizations do make those little connections with schools in terms of permaculture gardens and so on. But I'm thinking more and more about curricula, you know, the, the school curricula actually being centered around. I mean, even in our local schools, right beside an eco village, there isn't enough on climate action or food or sustainability or education around seasonal eating and i think that's that's one of the things that i've been thinking about mm -hmm. uh, but i want to you know i want to keep this obviously a wee bit more into the the subject line that you're talking about now, well i think that's a that's a big part of the subject yeah. you are going to have to educate not just the kids but everyone on a different thing uh the the sort of way that we approach it in feeding ourselves is that we're not going to have a choice in what's coming unless we feed ourselves and have those systems to support our local farmers and to distribute food locally, we're going to be scrambling. And people have no sense of that, like we had no sense of a pandemic until it hit. So yes, education, but it's not just for kids now, it's everyone. Brilliant. Where's the big line of people want to come in with comments and reflections and insights? And Kerry Meehan is looking to speak, Davey. You, can people put their hands up? It's very simple. Yeah, Kerry yeah, had her hand up there. Oh, I can't see that for some reason. Sorry, Kerry, in you That's come. Okay. Can, I, can I just say one of our most successful enterprises has been, can you hear me okay? Perfect, Kerry, yeah. Yes. One of our most successful things in Ards Wall Guard in the community project has been the school gardening and bringing children in two or three times during the season. And then they come in September 
and they we make a big feast and we cook all the food and we eat it in the garden mm -hmm. and that has done more to change children's attitudes to what is edible and children are eating all kinds of stuff that they wouldn't normally eat at home and because so many families feel that this is all very well but children don't like vegetables which is absolutely okay. crazy you know but it's lovely to but children do like vegetables they just need to come and eat them in the garden yeah and it's lovely when you do that in community and you're building social capital you're building relationships and knowledge of each other of the place as well as learning new skills christian volkman from patagonia you want to come in let me find the unmute here eh? sorry <clears throat> hello everybody I um, <clears throat> excuse the noise in the background. It's just that time. Um, the um, reason why I'm on this call is I'm, I'm a pure consumer. I like I've got a I've got a tiny bit of, of um, <clears throat> land outside, which is like two square meters, and I'm trying to grow beans on it for my for my trio at the moment. But uh, I've been with the um, Dublin CSA scheme for, uh, for a year now. Uh, I get my veg from Nathan up in uh, South Dublin, and I am trying to figure out. Um, what Patagonia could do locally uh, in, in, in our kind of customer community, so to speak, um, uh, to um, like we, we're always kind of trying to drive our customers into a circular economy type thinking. And uh, the, the CSA uh, idea is, is a given for that, like it's an absolute no brainer to go for. Like, but uh, my problem is, um, I can probably, like, as Fergus Smith was saying, we can, I can probably. Um, Get a community of interested people together through through our customers, um, but I don't have a farmer to go to. Like Nathan is already kind of operating the capacity and so on. Like so, so I am missing a link here of interested farmers um, to kind of bring into the into a conversation with my community. You know? So if anybody knows anybody or has any ideas how to find us, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, you can put your hand down there, Christian. Thanks for coming in and thanks for everything that Patagonias do to support the regenerative agenda. It's fantastic. Uh, I do think we probably need a dating uh, app for farmers and communities. That might be quite good. A Tinder for uh, CSA or, or solidarity food initiatives. Farmers, I'm sure, are out there wanting a market and communities are out there wanting food security. So it's just getting them together, isn't it? Uh, there's some great comments in the chat. Would any of the people that are putting some great comments like to speak that publicly so we can hear some other voices? Brendan and Donald, you're 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 having great. Uh, you're, you've got loads of great thoughts in there. Do you want to speak them or give us a little insight? Yeah, sure. Uh, apologies now. You might hear my daughter here. She's having her her evening meal before she goes to bed. So you hear a baby and know what that is. Uh, no, I was just talking to you. one of the things that has been an issue that I look, I'm only starting out in this myself, but a lot of the price points of organic and local food is it was beyond it was beyond my income point up until very recently. I was never so like I'm, I'm from a family that you know needed to buy those 49 cent carrots growing up, like and to go beyond that need to actually change the food system, that's what we have to address. And I see Fergal actually had some good stuff in about like you know, kind of social food press and like that. But just if anyone else has anything else on how do you actually go beyond that, or is the case that some CSA files are just happy that to serve the niche that's already, that's already willing to pay that little bit extra for quality food? Yeah, thanks, Brendan. It's the high cost of low price has been a, a difficult issue, I think, for good food. Um, so if we want to support slavery in Spain, bonded labor, and unecological farming practices, and get cheap food. I think more people are becoming aware of the ethics of that uh, and the need for it. And uh, so we need to now put more of our income into food or more of our energy into food production, uh, I think. Um, and again, you know, we have to imagine what's happening and what's going to happen and get ready, not just based on our current economic system, which could face a short to medium term collapse very quickly. So how do we how do we move people into um, appreciating local food, appreciating local farmers, and realizing you have to pay a fair price for that unless you want to support the unsustainable, unethical food system? Fergal. 
Oh, no, sorry, Judith and Fargal. Sorry, Judith. Yep, I totally agree that we need to have true cost accounting and including the food miles, including the water consumption, including the pay for agricultural workers and the producers. Now, it also means that yes, food will cost more, but not necessarily a huge amount more because there are no middlemen. If you're selling direct from your farm shop, or if you're going through a CSA or a farmer's market, there will not necessarily be that huge difference. What is very important though, is that people learn that they cannot go on eating ultra processed meat products with meat three times a day bought in the hypermarkets because the fruit and vegetables in the supermarkets are mainly coming from the other side of the world. I mean, I know in Waterford in the summer, they're selling peas and beans coming from Kenya. And there's only one place where I can buy Irish peas or beans. You know, there is a whole food chain out there, which is the industrial food chain that we have to break. And people need to learn to cook and eat slightly differently. They need to eat with the seasons and eat more vegetable-based food, plant-based food. I mean, I'm not a vegan. I do eat meat, but I know where it comes from. It comes from up the mountains and I know who's grown it and how. Yeah. I don't eat meat every day. The other thing is what Fergal mentioned about um, a basic food net, which is like in, Fra in French, it's called the food social security, the food safety net, which there are a couple of experiments of that around the world that have been made. Initially, um, Graziano de Silva, who's the retired director general of the FAO, introduced that with the Bolsa Familial in Brazil, and it does work. And some municipalities in France and in Spain have been subsidizing CSA shares or giving out food vouchers that people can spend on healthy local food. Also, it's quite common in the States and particularly in New York. And it has been one of the few ways that low income groups have been supported to access healthy food, which is particularly important mm -hmm. in a pandemic. So those are just the few points I wanted right, to... I think that's really important. You started off with a true cost accounting. We need to, yeah. Connor is mentioning in the chat there, better measurement of GDP. So we just measure the wrong things and stop subsidizing the wrong things. Yeah. Fergal, you want to come in? Yeah, that's just what I was going to say. I mean, I think food is also cheap because uh, we have a system which subsidizes a production model. So like in Ireland, that means 1.7 billion euros every year is transferred into farmers' pockets from uh, the public. Now, imagine what we could do with even just a fraction of that money if it was going into local production. I mean, so that's part of the reason that we're trying to focus with Tall of Bio on this on the policy framework, because we're saying, look, we've been ignored in that entire system since the beginning. The idea has always been commodity production for export. So um, we can't ignore that, I think, as citizens either, if we want to change the food system. I mean, ultimately, that is a huge amount of money that is going into, uh, and it's not just about the kind of production that it is, it's about where, where that production is destined for, and it's destined for going outside the country. So we're essentially supporting an export, uh, an, an industrialized export model with, with money. So when we talk about, and it's an incredibly complicated system uh, that we're not gonna go into in detail now, but like one of the, when I talked about direct payment for local producers, I was talking about saying, let's put money in the pockets of local producers. Let's put 10,000 euros into local producers' pockets. And all of a sudden, food might not be quite as expensive in your local economy uh, as, as, as it was before. And livelihoods for local farmers might be a bit better. So, I mean, 
yeah, I think those are things that we need to just be bold about at this stage. It's a time for bold ideas. It's a time to say, look, you've been giving money to that guy over there to produce beef to export to Turkey for the last 20 years. Now give me some money to grow, to grow vegetables for, for my town and, uh, you know, and keep, keep another kind of uh, economic model going for another 15 or 20 years. And I, I suppose those are the kind of conversations we want to get, kick off a little bit with Talib Bio as well. Yeah, and there's some good indicators that we are thinking now quite seriously about moving beyond growth, moving beyond these subsidies. You know, the regenerative economics model of Kate Rayworth really helps us see that we need to keep within the carrying capacity, but also build that social foundation that um, makes sure that we're all uh, can thrive. Ollie, do you want to come in at all with your piece there on on CAP? And, and Fergal, if you put your hand down so I can keep the... Yeah, this will probably be in your um, policy doc anyway, but just the idea that labour rather than land being the one of the things that subsidies pay for. Could you, we have like 12 people on our farm, on three hectares at the moment. Um, we're producing, three hectares isn't even a beef farm or a dairy farm. It's no use to beef or dairy. So like, if you think about, yeah, it's paying by land area, sorry, by, by labour units, and then by other public goods um, and in a hybrid system with lands, you know, that would be, that would revolutionize the opportunities for agroecology. But I think as well, the environmental pillar and Talib Bio are both going to come out with policy docs nearly at the same time. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity in feeding ourselves as well then in June or whenever we do it to actually really spotlight these policy docs and look for ways to bring the two together and to almost have a parallel process to you know, ag climatize 2030 or whatever the next version of, you know, food harvest and food wise is, because, you know, the pillar walked out of that process. Um, and, you know, we need to basically run a parallel process, I think, at this stage and work for synergies between environmental and, and good farming organizations. So maybe Ollie and Fergal and Fergal and Talib Bio that are here could maybe ensure that because the IEN's uh, policy doc is probably going to be just looking at the things that need to be done from the European or top down, where it sounds like Fargal Talabios could be a lot more, here's bottom up enablers that can ensure uh, this. Uh, there's some good uh, comments here. I don't know if, um, if anyone wants to come in to speak these. I mean, land access, of course, came up quite a few times. And in the <laughs> chat I saw there about the model of CLTs, community land trusts, which are generally for uh, housing and ensuring affordable housing, uh, but there's a regenerative land trust uh, pilot program looking at doing that for land. Uh, I think we need other models for securing land. Uh, yeah, and, Dave, Davey. There you go, Jim, you're in now, all yours. Yeah, um, I've just come from the education background mainly, but over 25 years I've watched young people study hard the culture and disappear into the electronic economy or somewhere else, primarily because they would, there was no support for them. They didn't have land and there weren't the springboard opportunities. Now there are some of those that are happening, but uh, model leases are absolutely essential. They need to be put in place. We can learn from partnerships that didn't work and the ones that did work over the years. Uh, so they'd be a top priority. But also, uh, uh, Fergal mentioned about the, the, the 1.7 billion going into CAP. That's, that's the biggest scandal of our time, because not alone is it not directed to people who are doing local food, but it's also going on high emissions farming and the biggest, the most unprogressive spending of EU money that there is. Big political argument to be made there. I hope it happens over the summer and is ongoing. And just finally, Davey, I think the, the gathering tonight is very informative. Um, <clears throat> I want to congratulate everybody on that. But I think we should go back to the original view, which was in the founding of um, the organic movement, which was that food was a medicine. And if we can subsidize food for, um, if we can subsidize medicine for people who are on social welfare, mm. then if food itself is the real medicine, particularly at a time of a pandemic and immunity challenges, then I think we need to make the argument at councillor level. And I know you have Sean, a councillor here in Limerick City, uh, who would, I remember when there was butter was uh, made available to people who were on social welfare and milk and school milk. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not reinventing the wheel, loads of possibilities. But again, 
thank you very much for the evening tonight and uh, looking forward to more of these. Thanks, David. Brilliant, Jim, and thanks for your work over the last few decades on educating those many people that when the system starts to collapse, will be leaving those digital jobs and hopefully finding their way back to the land. Uh, anyone else want to come in? It'd be good to hear some other voices. Molly, are you interested in unmuting and just maybe speaking your comment? I'll say something in a minute if it's okay. Yeah, thanks, Una. Um, no, I was just going to say I'm kind, I'm kind of here listening. I've been trying to set up a CSA now for several years. I attempted it from a consumer perspective in Sweden a couple of years ago and ran up against the knowledge. It was where people didn't know what was seasonal and what could even be grown in Sweden for a local market, both from the farmer perspective and from the um, consumer perspective, where literally someone stood, stood sat in front of me and said, but what would a family of four do with a kilo of potatoes a week? Um, which was just mind blowing. And at the moment, like I'm in a class, there's 40 of us in a class. We're all about to graduate with an organic horticulture cert. Um, everyone's eager. The age point is quite young, which is quite good. And um, given our bachelor and bachelorette farmers aging population, and most of them don't have access to land. They have nothing. They're growing in pots. They're doing their practical session in pots. Yeah. And I'm very privileged to have inherited some land, um, but that's not the case. And the problem is, is that there is no pathway, unfortunately, for people my age and younger to get land. Yeah. No, no bank is going to loan us money. And if we do inherit, they're going to have to sell the land to pay the taxes if they're not related to them. And I've seen at least three cases in the last four years locally of this happening. And mm. um, like there's huge policy blockages to getting young people back to the land. Um, but thank you very much to everyone tonight. I think it's just it's been a great learning experience. Brilliant, Molly, and thanks for bringing that in. Una Dwyer, do you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of, I suppose, go back to the whole education thing with um, with the kids. My my son actually stopped um, taking home ec and then Simon in, in school because they were cooking um, things that I used to cook in the convent in Tipperary a long, long time ago, which was sponge cakes um, with with lots of flour and cheap flour and sugar. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> nutritionally inert, you'd be better off eating like the bag that the flour came in. So there's a huge disconnect, I think, there with, with um, over the lockdown, um, a couple of my local neighbors and stuff asked could their kids come into my tunnel and my garden and actually just hang out and learn a little bit about food. And every single one of them could not wait to get into the tunnel and they just literally started eating mm -hmm. fresh herbs, greens, all the overwintering, kale, everything that had gone to flower. And it was just incredible to see them do that um, because we've lost, we have that disconnect of actually getting out there and eating stuff straight off plants. Yeah. I did yeah. a wonderful workshop with Ku and Bio, which is um, an organization that look after the water of um, South Galway and North Clare about four years ago. And we had 12 schools came into a, a venue and I was teaching them about seaweed. And every one of them was from a school that lived on the coast and not, not one of the kids had eaten seaweed ever. Yeah. Yeah. And every single one of them ate seaweed that I had on the table, sea spaghetti. And they were actually jumping up and down about it. And they went home and told their parents and their parents were ringing me going, this is incredible. We're going foraging tomorrow. We're going actually going out getting food. We're, we're doing this. So it's the disconnect. We've lost touch. Well, that, and it's the convenience of, of everything wrapped up and packaged. That. Yeah, I think disconnect is the key. Fergal's uh, highlighting that there in the chat. We're disconnected from ourselves. We're disconnected from each other. We're disconnected from the food. We're disconnected from nature. And there's the challenge and the need for rethinking everything. Jason Horner, you're, you want to come in? Yeah, I just want to pick up on Molly's point there of pathways for um, people who are studying horticulture. And the OGI has been running an internship now for seven or eight years. And it was with exactly your case in mind, people coming out of college, get them some experience on a farm. And actually, at the moment, there's a lot of farms looking for labour as well, um, that if people wanted to have a career without actually owning land, that's a distinct possibility these days as well. So maybe make it 
maybe have a look at the OGI website and uh, make yourself familiar with 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 the the program because I think we have twelve people this year. Um, one of the people running the farm in Clock Jordan is one of our ex interns, and generally we found that maybe seventy or eighty percent of people stay in the sector having done the the program, and yeah, we're, we're growing growers, which is great. Growing growers, I love that, Jason. And OGI's Organic Growers of Ireland, just in case anyone didn't uh, know that what that was. Thanks, Jason. Um, keep the insights going in the chat there. We're going to have two other now short presentations, and then we'll try to consolidate and bring everything together before we close at nine o'clock. So I am just going to introduce um, the Open Food Network quickly, just in a few minutes, just to give you a a sense of um, some of the, the new options of distribution. So the Open Food Network's an open source platform. That means it's owned and controlled by us. It's not proprietary. You may have heard of Neighborhood. Neighborhood's a brilliant platform, I'm not dissing it, but this is a platform that's designed by food. As I found out now, uh, in the meeting some of the global advocates, they were from Via Capesina, they were regenerative ag people, they're permaculturists, they're open source uh, digital uh, people that want uh, uh, freedom. And so they produced, uh, about, only about eight years ago, a platform that allows, it's pretty much a virtual farmer's market, which in COVID times is really important to connect uh, people that need healthy and local food with the producers that can uh, produce that food. So the OFN platform, if people at the Feeding Ourselves last March, the week before the lockdown started, uh, it was one of our main themes in that. And what followed after a brilliant presentation from Nick from OFN UK, um, after the lockdown started, a group of people from Dublin Food Co-op, from Transition Ireland, uh, Permaculture, came together and, and got the OFN platform into Ireland. Um, so we have now OFN Ireland, there's the link, openfoodnetwork.ie, uh, where you can put your profile as a farmer up. The difference with Open Food Network to neighbor food is you don't have to wait for a market um, to emerge in your area. You can actually use this as a shop front and already there's shop fronts now in Ireland with producers just using this. So it was officially launched in 2020. At that time, there was 13 uh, national open food networks. There is now 21. So this is growing hugely. And just to stress again, the authenticity of the people behind that. We applied at Clock Jordan Community Farm to rethink Ireland to actually set up the open food hub here in Clock Jordan uh, in our recreate center and, and to support what we're doing on the farm. And the open food hub has two aspects. Many of you here, Joanne's involved with the Donegal Food Growers. We're doing training for hubs and producers. So we've got six trainings uh, planned for producers and we're gonna have other trainings for, um, for producers. And we just slipped in the support. So we've been supported to offer this webinar tonight through that funding. So I, I just want to stress how important it is. It's the last link for practicing food sovereignty if we can really control the distribution or have autonomy over that. Now the Rico Ring, as, as Fergal mentioned, absolutely brilliant, nice and formal way, but we're still using the platforms of the billionaires who are making more and more money as we sort of try to and build a sense of food security and solidarity. So it's the wrong platform to use. This isn't uh, too complicated either. I think, um, again, it's been stressed that farmers may not have the digital knowledge or the, the abilities here, but through support with communities or as another diversification for people in the community that want to, to do something, this is perfect. And with the Open Food Network, the platform costs are minuscule, two and a half percent compared to 10% on neighborhood. And then the hub, if you're using a hub, decides what they're going to, to, um, to do too. So please look out for the Open Food Network in your area. You can go on to openfoodnetwork.ie and uh, you, can, you, can, uh, um, you, you, you can put your profile up, which just helps if anyone's creating a hub or a virtual farmer's market 
to collect those. We plan to launch our local market in June, we hope, uh, which will help us for the CSA to manage our gluts and to even think about adding value, not just distributing our vegetable subscribers. And obviously here in Clock Jordan, we have a number of solidarity food initiatives, a bread club, an egg club, a mushroom club, a whole food buyers club. Those subscription make sure that we are directly supporting food producers. And the OFN, I think, you can just maybe just add some additional value. So I just wanted to make uh, that little presentation and pitch uh, for the OFN. There'll be plenty other opportunities to, to look at it, but just I want to stress, and I'll say it for the third time, this is an authentic platform. It's not a platform like Uber or Airbnb that's extracting wealth as we share and use our stuff. This is a platform done by people that are advocating for food sovereignty and food security and community resilience and are the real deal. So I just wanted to, to bring that in. Any reflections on that before we move in to our presentation from, um, for, for, from Natalie? I'll just leave it open if there's quick questions on that. Okay. Quick question, Davey. Just yeah. as a grower, uh, how do I engage with the OFN? Well, what do we need to do? I mean, just, is there a website or what's the? Openfoodnetwork.ie. You can put your profile up. You could actually use it for root and leaf and start to trade your cells. Um, um, you can use it in many different ways. In the UK, they're now using it for food poverty to make sure that food is distributed well. It's a diversification for people in communities as well that might want to add value to something as well. Um, who was asking there? Nathan says he's using OFN for distributing our produce in Dublin, and it's well worth a look. It's handy. The mobile version on the phone is quite use, easy to use. And we are going to be offering at the Open Food Hub uh, more support in this. And I think it fits into even what you said, Fargo, about the need for food hubs in every, every town. It needs a food hub, which isn't just market. It might be uh, adding value. It might be education. Uh, you know, so it fits into this trend of, of that. Okay, Gareth, do you want to come in quickly? Yeah, just on that same note, ah. on that same note of a food hub, so it was mentioned earlier about like some, like a group or maybe a person who pulls together local producers mm -hmm. and through the food hub, like I'm really lo looking forward to exploring the food hub and I know Cam is involved with us and in that very much. Mm -hmm. But like, as was, yeah, so it's from the producers, I understand how it works, but a food hub, like somebody who's pulling together multiple local producers, how might that work there? Well, it's just like a virtual farmer's market. It's just like uh, setting up a market. You bring together a number of producers. You have on the platform, it deals with all the transactions. So you can see in your local area from your market, all the different producers and you order what you need, what you want that week. And then you come to the distribution point or pay extra for it to be delivered. And it's there. Even people right now are using the open food network uh, to do all the orders, but then just meet in a car park like the Rico Ring and exchange money without even using the platform. So we can get creative with it. And I, I know, Gareth, that you guys are in Monaghan are going to be are involved in our training. So hopefully we can build capacity here. And I'm seeing neighborhoods set up, then maybe three or four new ones in our area. So this is just, again, the, the, um, the, the, the version that's done by us and owned and controlled by our movement. Uh, Seamus Bradley, I also think we don't want to alienate existing conventional farmers, but rather need to think on how we help transition and working together. Obviously, you know, we've got a lot of transitioning to regenerative or holistic management and uh, just thinking about cutting middlemen out or uh, ensuring that we give as much of the income back to the producers. Ollie, you want to come in and then I'm going to introduce Natalie. Yeah, just like super briefly, the great thing about OFN is that the farmer has all the selling done before they turn up at the market. Um, there's no, you know, so you're not like standing there all day selling, like pre people pre-order all week and then you just turn up with what's needed, what's been pre-ordered. Um, so that's why it's great. I like the way neighbor food is, but owned by us. So that's just a quick two liner on it. Okay. Just so that we can finish in time and have a bit of reflection after uh, Nat Natalie, I'm going to introduce Natalie now. So again, if there's any questions, insights, get them into the chat. If there's anything for either Natalie or anything you've heard tonight, we can process this and harvest it into something that will be useful for us all, for the networks. Um, 
So Natalie is going again from urgency. Natalie is uh, Natalie Markifka is the training coordinator at urgency. Uh, she's also a steering group member of the Dublin CSA, and she was the co-founder of Future, uh, which many of you know. So Natalie, over to you. Yes, hi, thank you very much. Um, um, first, I want to say it's, uh, it's really great to be here tonight and um, yeah, just to be part of this very rich conversation we're having here. So, so I want to tell you a little bit more about what I'm doing at Urgency. So as you heard of already from Judith, education is, is really a big part of, of what we do. And um, I joined uh, Urgency as a training coordinator last year in November together with um, Sam, our pedagogical designer. And we are forming now the, uh, the educational team at Urgency. And we used this time um, where we couldn't do any physical trainings because Urgency has been doing over the, the last um, decade, I would even say, um, many, many uh, live trainings in different parts of Europe and um, around the world, I would say, during the different conventions and things like this. Um, but um, what was still missing was the online part. And so we came in in November to help to develop an online learning platform, uh, which will be launched, uh, we hope, in autumn um, this, this year. Um, and the first course uh, that we're developing right now is a course on how or we can get um, members of food communities more involved actually in managing the communities and understanding also the food system better. So it really fits into what we are talking about here that we, we need a whole community for this transition and, and urgency is really engaged in, in educating this community. Um, because as Judith said, we have access to millions of eaters around the world and um, Physical trainings, obviously, they're always restricted in geography and also the size, but we hope that through the online training, we can reach further out. Uh, we can connect also different people together who were maybe not able before to, to meet and to, to stay connected. So our approach is very much to yeah, create engaging content that will help food communities to thrive and to build capacity as well. So another course in the pipeline that is actually already ready to, but not yet ready on the hub is on uh, land advocacy. So um, that one will go more into that advocacy work and, and also another ele elemental pillar of, of urgency. And, and we, we, we touched on it already in this conversation, how important it is that we need land and we need to be engaged politically in some ways as well to to allow you know or to bring policies to to talk to policy makers and to to allow policy changes and to make some pressure um yeah some maybe i can mention also one that is still in the early days is on community supported fisheries which is um really something we've been working on for, for a long time to have something so um, yeah, we're, we're very excited to bring different topics um, to the table there, and we hope that we'll have a broad engagement um, from farmers, but also from um, from eaters from from all around the world in in on the hub. And our approach will be very much a, a blended approach. So you can imagine it that we have some modules on the hub that you can do in a self-paced. Um, way but also live sessions on zoom where we come together and we invite um, experts and, and and people mentors who can who can speak from their own experience mm -hmm. and we'll also do the live session uh, the live training obviously also as well face-to-face -face training will happen again someday i we we are very hopeful that it will <laughs> so yeah um what can i add um maybe something that we are working on that will be available a little bit later is that we want to allow also um other networks to run their own cohorts on our hub so they can use our course material uh, and run it in in their own groups um which is especially important i think because each each network has their own geographical, you know, like issues they want to work on. And maybe it makes sense for a network to run a course just with a local cohort. So that will take a little bit more time to develop, but it is something that is in the making. I, I just want to, to let you know that this will be a 
possibility. Um, and I just want to use the last few minutes also to just um, advertise two webinars that we are doing. Uh, one will be this week actually on the 15th and it's on community supported agriculture and community support uh, community seed banks. Um, so what's the relation of how can community supported agriculture support um, seed sovereignty? Um, and then on the 15th, uh, no, sorry, that's this week, on the 22nd, <laughs> I'm a bit tired already, on the 22nd, we have another one, which I already posted, but I'll post the links again on how can we engage uh, CSA members better. So I think that's, um, that might be quite interesting. Maybe you want to pass it on to members of your food communities um, who are really engaged and we are building on the whole thing of food citizens. Um, so citizens that are really engaged in supporting food communities and that can be anything csas but on co-ops and you know lspas so okay. it is open really to, to all those different people so. okay wonderful natalie wonderful that's great thanks for the work and of course csa ireland are a member of urgency and uh, connected i've just shared a link for a survey that csa ireland are doing which includes training needs and uh, we're very interested in what you just said there about potentially using urgency platform from the CSA Ireland and be getting our own training up there. Please, anyone, there's, it's on the CSA Ireland Facebook. The link is there in the chat. Uh, it'd be great. It'll take like five minutes just to go through. We're trying to get a sense of the different uh, types of CSA and considerations uh, farmers, uh, producers need and communities need to go forward. So you don't need to be uh, a CSA to be uh, doing that. Thank you for, for that. We're, one more announcement, and then I, I'm going to bring to a close. If you know me, I get anxious about not finishing time. Um, so um, Ollie has just shared our big new newsletter from our Clock Jordan Community Farm. Any announcements, just put them in to the chat. I do highly recommend you join CSA Ireland or Tullive Bio uh, or uh, a local food grower network like you have in Donegal. Uh, and even this, the survey asks which network you belong to, because I think we need a convergence of that. And I'm going to finish my piece with um, uh, an announcement for the end of June, we think. We want to do a, a blended or probably distributed um, feeding ourselves, bringing together the strands you've heard tonight and the regenerative ag, the CSA and new models uh, of food sovereignty uh, into uh, some event. We do hope to launch the IEN's um, a policy statement in relation to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the governments. And that would be great, Fergal, to try and bring together the, the policy statement from, from Tull of Bio. So we have come to an end of this event. I really want to thank all of you for coming. It's been great. We've kept everyone, didn't lose anyone. Uh, thanks so much for, to Judith, Fergal, Joanna, Virgil, Natalie, and of course, all of you for engaging, not just in this webinar, but with this topic of solidarity, food, regenerative ag, and community supported agriculture. It's so important at these times uh, that we do that. Uh, and our time is here, really. We need to be ready now for quite a shift, both in stimulus packages and funding, but also in mindset where people will be looking for us. And we just need to get ready for that. So thanks everyone. We don't have to run away quickly. We can stay open now for a bit of social if you wish, but thanks again from CSA Ireland and the Open Food Network here in Clock Jordan. Thank you.